James. Hello, Charles Thomas. How are you? Very, very good, and I thank you for calling in. And uh, we are live uh, now, and uh, we have quite a few people uh, attending. And so uh, I just really, again, want to thank you so very much for uh, for participating in this uh, today. Well, you're certainly welcome. It's a pleasure. How is everything out in uh, Virginia? Beautiful. Just a beautiful day. We had a little rain last night, but um, as I was telling you the other day, fall is one of my favorite seasons here. We live on a little farm um, sort of close to the ocean, which you've visited, and uh, it's the ocean's still warm enough to swim here in Virginia Beach, and, and yet the nights are cool and the days are our cool 70 degrees or whatever today, just lovely, lovely. Well, that's fantastic. And so, uh, Charles, I uh, was uh, would like to share with our guests a little bit about you. And before I do, when I was reviewing your uh, bio, I saw that you have a birthday coming up in about three days, so I wanted to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> oh, you're great, James. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know, when we get to be our age, those birthdays are not as, uh, <laughs> we don't look forward to them the way we did when we were little. But I am well, I, exactly a good talking to and, uh, a good Ann and family, I both family. Have, uh, Ann and I are both Libras as well, so we have our birthdays coming up on the 12th and 14th. <laughs> well, happy birthday to both of you. Please give my love to Anne. Thank you very, very much. And so let me just share with our guest a little bit about you. And, and this is on the slide for those of you that are uh, joining in. Dr. Charles Thomas Casey is the grandson of Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet. Charles Thomas is a prolific author and former president of the ARE and Edgar Casey Foundation. He is a wonderful speaker and a man of great wisdom and of kind, gentle demeanor. He received a reading from Edgar that stated uh, that he is the reincarnation of Edgar Casey's beloved grandfather, who was also a mystic and had a huge influence on young Edgar Casey. Charles Thomas Casey holds a PhD, a doctorate in psychology, and he was a professor at the University of Maryland before returning to serve as president of the Edgar Casey Foundation and ARE. He is the son of Hugh Lynn Casey, Edgar Casey's firstborn son, and he will be a keynote speaker at the event we are hosting in Colorado uh, in May of 2015, and he will speak on sole purpose and share some of his insights and personal uh, stories on the uh, life of uh, Edgar Casey, And I would also like to add that the ARE has had a tremendous impact on my life. Uh, and we at Earth Keeper have been all deeply touched and inspired by the work of Edgar Casey and the Association of Research and Enlightenment. We feel the ARE is the most important and the most credible spiritual organization on the planet. We've visited the ARE twice in the last year, and the entire team of teachers, of staff, of support teams at the ARE are the most welcoming, humbling, and kind people that you can ever hope to meet. And we highly encourage everyone to become a member of the ARE, a lifetime member. And we will be beginning next week offering special incentives for people to join the ARE. And also, at our Colorado Stargate event, there will be a team from the ARE that will be providing uh, sales of books from the ARE, specifically of uh, Charles, Dr. Charles Thomas's books and John Van Auken, and they will be set up uh, to take memberships. And so... It's just a wonderful, wonderful organization, and uh, I can't speak enough about it. And so, Charles, it truly is a honor to have you with us today. And can you share with our listeners a little bit about the ARE? 
Well, uh, I'll be happy to, James. And again, thank you for having me. Uh, the the ARE was set up originally, as as you probably know, as a a, a nonprofit organization um, that people would join in order to get a reading from my grandfather. My, uh, Edgar Casey was arrested uh, several times, a few times, uh, in, in, when for practicing medicine for without a license or for um, uh, pretending to be a psychic. I, I don't know the specific uh, charges, but those sorts of things in various cities, Detroit and New York and and um, a, a number of places. And uh, a reading was given asking how – this was very stressful for him, I, I'm told, and um, – I depressed him. I, he considered to stop. He was just a just a mess. And um, maybe we can come back to that. But in uh, when a reading was given about how to how to best prevent this kind of situation from occurring, the, it was suggested that a a nonprofit organization be set up and that a, a membership, a small membership fee, be charged. And in that way. Uh, it, w it would prevent Edgar Casey um, from being arrested, and so that they, because these people were members, the people who received readings uh, were automatically members of the association and, and were part of the research, the ongoing research to determine the validity, the accuracy of the information in the readings, and so that's how it began. And then, um, as after he died. There were decisions made, especially by my father, to to preserve, try to preserve the 14,000 readings that Edgar Casey had given and that had been carefully transcribed, and to try to index those by subject and try to test generally, slowly test the general helpfulness of that information, which had been given for the most part, as you know, James, for individuals. Many yes. over half of the readings for for people asking questions about their physical health, but on many hundreds and hundreds of other subjects that that you know well. And so, the the association it has and publications occurred, books about his life and so forth. And um, more and more people have become interested. And uh, now it it continues to be. I think both an associate, the association or group of people with similar interests who are interested in testing or researching in their own way, testing the general applicability or application of the information in the readings and the enlightenment part. Boy, James, I used to worry about that, you know, in, in grade school and even high school, I guess, here at Virginia Beach where you put down your father's occupation on these forms in school, and boy, when I would try to put manager of association for research and enlightenment, I would I would bog down in a hurry, and especially with the word enlightenment, you know, what in the world, goodness, what was my father involved with, and it's, I often used to think education, and I still think, you know, although it's, it's a spiritual kind of education that's a focus of the ARE, many people think who are members of the ARE find the the connection with other like-minded folks, other people who are who are on the spiritual path, trying to understand who they are spiritually and what their life purpose is, find a connection through the ARE uh, almost as helpful or more so than the information in the readings themselves. So that's really, I think, what it's about. Well, it's it's an absolutely life changing organization, and uh, Charles Thomas, when you graciously had Ann and I at your house uh, in October, I uh, of last year, we were deeply, deeply touched, and I think I shared with you that uh, the way that I came across Edgar Casey, I was actually by education, I'm an engineer and geologist, and I was working in Brazil as a geological engineer, and I was single at that time, and I was working on the banks of the Amazon River. I was the only 
American there, and uh, it was an extraordinary place, uh, but it was quite isolated. It was 300 miles west of uh, Manaus, which is where the Rio Amazonas and Rio Negro come together. So it was an incredibly remote area. It was 1978, and I was working there, and I would not leave my cabin at night because uh, we were on the banks of the river, and the mosquitoes were so thick at night that it was just unbelievable. And interestingly, you didn't see any mosquitoes in the daytime. And there were actually dolphins in the Amazon River. There are, and that's a fact. And because of the tannic acids and vegetable essences that are in the river, uh, these dolphins were sort of a pink-purple color. And so I would go down and watch these dolphins uh, who would seem to school around. And the river was about a kilometer wide, or I'm sorry, 13 kilometers wide and 300 meters or 300 feet deep, 100 meters deep. And wow. a massive the river, and at night I would go to my cabin, so I read, and a German man gave me a copy of There Is a River, uh, written by Thomas Suger, and it changed my life. I read it cover to cover, and I was walking on air for days, because I had been brought up in Arkansas as a, uh, my family were devout, born-again Baptist, and uh uh, I could never totally come to terms with the limits of those teachings, and when I read Casey, I found those answers, and I have been in gratitude to the ARE ever since. I spent 33 years living overseas as a foreigner, and I would come home once a year and buy an entire suitcase full of books from Edgar Casey and the ARE, <laughs> uh, uh, and that's but uh, that's what I would read for the next year, and it was just, and I did that for over 30 years, and so it's just been an incredible group, and I cannot tell you what an honor it is to speak with you. I want to acknowledge you for the work of your family, of your father, of your grandfather, and of you. And well, so you, uh, just to move on a little bit, Charles Thomas, you became a, a Ph.D. in psychology and were a professor at the University of Maryland for a number of years. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And, and you know, um, talking about my father, James, and my, and my grandfather, I, um, I am often asked, um, what, was, what was Edgar Cayce really like? And... I, I have a quick answer because I didn't. I have no memory of him. I, you mentioned as we began that I had readings from him. I did. I had the, the what were called life readings. Uh, I had one of those requested by my parents when I was a few hours old, and then a, a number of other readings from him up until the time I was three when he died and so um i have no conscious memories of him however as i'm often asked uh, what was he like um let let me try if it, if it's all right james let me let me share a little bit from our family because i listened to my father and my mother who both of course knew him well and gladys his secretary and many others my uncle um, my grandfather's uh, younger son, my father's brother, Edgar Evans, who, who wrote the, the book on Atlantis and so forth, I heard them answer that question many times. And one of the ways that, that um, I have found it most helpful to answer the question is to talk about Edgar Cayce a little bit from three different angles. One, just what, what was the man like? What was was he like as a father or a grandfather or or a, a friend, a neighbor, and so forth? And then a little bit of maybe about his psychic ability. What 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 did he say about his own psychic ability? He was asked over and over what what was going on when he would go into this unconscious trance state and answer questions on so many hundreds of different subjects. And then a a little bit maybe a little bit on the content of his readings. So first. You know, what was the man like? The, the the story that I heard my mother tell most often when she was asked what he was like, um, she was she and I, I was just a year or two old, uh, spent a good deal of time in my grandmother and grandfather's home uh, right toward the end of his life 
Um, my father was in the Army overseas, World War II, and was away for several years, and was away when my grandfather died, actually. But in any case, my mother would tell this story about the whole the whole family and the, the little group there. There wasn't an A.R.E. at that time, but uh, the little group of, of people who were trying to work with him were very excited because the book that you just mentioned, Thomas Chagru's book, was going to be published and and was published, and they received a telegram that several crates, wooden crates of these copies, hardback copies of There is a River, were being shipped to the Casey home, and people were very excited, and, and Gladys, Edgar Casey's secretary, and others called other friends, and a large group, large, uh, say maybe 50 or so, um, had gathered in the home when the crates were delivered, and the crates were opened. She said, um, my mother said that Mr. Casey opened the, the crates with a hammer, went out to his shop. Um, he loved to do woodwork in the shop by himself out behind his, behind the garage, their home. You know, James, I have a, I mentioned to you, I have a, a wooden table that I want to show you the next time you come here that was made by my grandfather. And on that table, I have a piece of lapis that I've been working with that was a gift from you. In any case, he loved to do woodwork. And and as the celebration started and he, my grandfather had opened these wooden crates and they were taking the books out and they were reading passages to each other and so forth, my mother and my grandmother looked around for Edgar Casey, where he, he had disappeared. And um, they, they were making little... Uh, toasts and and so forth and and uh, everyone celebrating. They couldn't find him and my mother went out to the garage and he was um, had taken the empty wooden crates out in the garage and was pulling them apart and chopping them up, making kindling for the for the fireplace. And just she, she was saying um, that for for her that was so typical of him, sort of wanting to be alone and celebrate a little bit alone and a very practical kind of person. He loved to, to uh, he had a, a vegetable garden at his home uh, all his life, wherever he lived. He had um, a little, a grape, little, not a big vineyard, but some grape vines and would, would grow grapes and make in the basement of that home where, where I used to play as a little boy, he made wine, both from the grapes and from dandelions and canned vegetables, loved to fish by himself. I think um, there, there was a good deal of, of time spent by him with people who were curious about him, who wanted to meet him, who wanted to ask him questions. And so to balance that, there was lots of time spent by him um, by himself, with with nature, fishing, gardening, doing woodwork in his shop, and and uh, although I didn't know him, I can certainly imagine a, a person of that sort, very practical, down to earth sort of sort of person. There's a little story. I'm going to go on too long here, James, but a little story no, about this, Fascinating. this wine that um, that he would make in the basement, this house where they lived at that time. For, for many years, most of their life here in Virginia Beach, was right across the street from the Catholic Church, still there, still here in Virginia Beach, the, the main Catholic Church in Virginia Beach. And there was an old priest um, who, who was the priest at the Catholic Church right across the street who became good friends with Edgar Casey, And they he would come to the basement, and while... Mr. Casey was making wine and uh, working with his vegetable, canning vegetables and so forth, and they would talk. The priest wanted nothing to do with Edgar Casey's psychic ability or the content of the readings, but they just liked each other as, as human beings, as, as men, and would, would uh, laugh and tell fishing stories together and so forth. Well, there was an occasion late in Edgar Casey's life, I guess, after the publication of There is a River, when 
things were were very um, confused and busy. Mail was coming in mail bags to his home, and uh, my father, as I said, was away in the service. Both boys were were in the army, and um, a letter was opened while Edgar Casey was in trance to for him to give a reading to the person who was requesting the reading, and the letter was from Germany and was written in German, and as Gladys held the letter, I'm told, his secretary held the letter that was in German, and she couldn't read it, Mr. Casey began to speak in German. Now, he, he knew no German, no foreign language, and they, my grandmother, Mr. Casey's wife, Gertrude, stopped the reading immediately, and someone, there were several people in the room, someone said, go get Father Habits. The, the, the priest across the street was from Germany, this old priest, and and they someone went over, the, Edgar Casey's lying, if you can imagine, lying unconscious on the couch, and, and Father Habits wouldn't come in the room with Edgar Casey giving the reading, usually. Didn't want to know about it, didn't want to talk about it, but they told him what was going on. He came over, and and the story goes, he he brought a candle and <laughs> lighted a candle and held a candle and walked back to Mr. Casey's study where he was where he was on the couch unconscious and sat next to Gladys and to my grandmother sat between the two of them and as Mr. Casey began again he was speaking in German and Father Habit the old German priest was whispering the translation the rough translation to Gladys, who was transcribing it in English. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine that, that James? I just, it just um, boggles the mind. What 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 was going on there? I just um, a, a, a very unusual man in one sense, but both in terms of his friendship with that priest and his his chopping up the the crates that the that there is a river came in rather than in there with the celebration and it just shows a little bit of a glimpse I think of the kind of kind of person he was that is absolutely amazing Charles Thomas we have a few questions that are coming in and sure. so if if you don't mind one of the questions is what were some of the past lifetimes of Edgar Casey that he spoke about in his readings Sure. I mentioned a few minutes ago, I think, James, that there was a category of readings that came to be called life readings. There were, of the 14,000 readings that he gave, about 2,000 of these readings were called life readings because people essentially asked, those 2,000 people asked, uh, how can this entity, how can this soul, this person, lead a happy, successful life? life and uh, that my parents asked that question about me when they got this life reading for me and these other people who had life readings asked the same thing and and in those life readings typically about half a dozen past lifetimes as a human being in the earth were described for each of these people and uh, these were lifetimes where um, strengths and weaknesses occurred that might well be um, come up in this lifetime and, and it, that it, it might be helpful to better understand those from the perspective of these past lives. And, and there were sort of epochs, historical periods that came up over and over. And those periods that were given for these 2,000 or so people who had life readings, were also the periods that, that were given for Edgar Casey when he gave himself uh, several life readings. And one of those was, involved ancient, ancient Egypt, where he was a priest, um, an Egyptian priest, and, and it was in that incarnation, he said in his life reading for himself, where he began to develop these psychic abilities that that manifested again in this lifetime as Edgar Cayce. Uh, that was an early, early lifetime. Another one that was given for him in his life reading 
a very different situation was in early America. And again, many of these 2,000 people who had life readings were also told that they were a part of that historical epoch, uh, revolutionary war time, early time in the among the founding fathers in the 13 colonies and, and all, all of that period in early America. Edgar Cayce, you, I'm sure you know this, James, but um, gave a, a lifetime for himself as a riverboat gambler on the Mississippi River, gave his name, and uh, that in that fairly recent past life, recent compared to ancient Egyptian lifetime, in that fairly recent lifetime as a riverboat gambler, he had this psychic ability, but he misused it. He cheated at cards, and he cheated with women, and through the misuse of that psychic ability in that lifetime with this character, as this character named John Bainbridge, uh, the, the, the effect of the misuse of the psychic ability, the, the selfish and destructive use of the psychic ability, the, the, the karma from that um, in this lifetime was that the psychic ability was unconscious. He, he, until toward the very end of his life, I'm told, he was not psychic at a conscious waking level. He had to go into this unconscious trance state in order to um, to to uh, touch on this on his psychic ability and use it to to help people and of course he was very focused on um, on trying to help people. You know, Charles Thomas, the yeah. the John Bainbridge lifetime has been an area that has had tremendous interest for me, and I've given it a lot of thought, and it. And it provides a lot of of really beautiful things to for me to to contemplate. And one of those would be that no matter how high we go in any one lifetime, we still have the responsibility to maintain the integrity of what has been gained in order to keep it. And on another question, and this is what I want to pose to you that has come to me before or, or that I've contemplated, is the idea that all lifetimes are simultaneous. And this has been taught by people uh, like Seth, Jane Roberts, and Metatron speaks about time. Uh, in the third dimension, space is fixed and time flows, whereas on the other side of the veil, uh, time is fixed, and space flows, you might say. Right. And but right. there is that idea that all lifetimes exist simultaneously. And that posed for me the question, if that's the case, are all of our lifetimes in linear sequence? And I wondered, and I would be interested in your feelings, could John Bainbridge have been an earlier lifetime for Edgar Casey? Although it was, you know, although it was not linear, but could it be a lifetime when his, when he came in, perhaps even before Egypt? Did, what are your feelings on that? I, I I agree with everything you said, of course, James. I I think it's hard for us to grasp a no time, no space, or all time is one time concept. The Casey reading certainly suggest that that's the case beyond uh, this physical dimension in the earth plane that we're involved with as souls right now. And I, I certainly think that that's a possibility. I, I don't know, um, you know, it, when you, when James, when you start using the term before, if the John Brainbridge was before, could that have been a before a ancient Egypt? A, a, we're, a lesser we're developed time. soul. Yes. I, I think absolutely yes. I, th I think that's certainly a possibility and thought about that also. It, it certainly makes things um, um, more more complex and at the same time more understandable if we, if we add this concept of, of uh, no time and space as we understand it beyond this physical 
to mention. The, the idea that maybe certain lifetimes are connected to certain lifetimes, and then there are certain lifetimes, I think, that we choose uh, in a certain way to embrace manner of speaking, our dark side, just to understand the other side of the coin, to, Absolutely. you know, that, uh, that we we have to learn the importance of of the right path, and then sometimes we learn that through the school of hard knocks, or what uh, you might call the university of duality, of free free will, cause and effect, and uh, and it, it's fascinating. Charles Thomas, there's a book written by Pulitzer Prize winner Kurt Vonnegut called Slaughterhouse Five. Have you ever read that book or seen that movie? I've heard of the book, you know. I, uh, I have not read it, James. You know, it came out years ago, and it's sure. about a man who became unstuck in time, and he would live different parts of his lifetime out of, con. you know, at one point he'd be a prisoner of war in Dresden, Germany, and in another part he would be older and be a dentist, and uh, he's talking about uh, the, the nonlinear aspect of time that he became unstuck. And Kurt Vonnegut uses the vehicle of saying that extraterrestrials came and took him to another planet, and when he was there, he could look back at his lifetime, and this is the phrase that I've always remembered. He said, when you look at earthlings from a higher perspective, they're one being with baby legs on one end and old person legs on the other, like a span of the Rocky Mountains, and that always <laughs> fascinated me. Oh, you my could, goodness. You can see wow. every aspect. But another question has come in, and that is, uh, was Edgar Cayce Pythagoras? Uh, apparently, um, who was the novelist, uh, uh, the New York Times bestseller that wrote about Cayce? Is it Stanley Kirkpatrick? Sidney Kirkpatrick. Sydney, yeah. sorry. Sidney Kirkpatrick. I was listening to an interview that he gave on the ARE a few years ago, and uh, he was given access to some of the uh, unpublished uh, readings that Casey gave, and uh, and these were fascinating. He was apparently he gave readings for for Tesla, for uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, and, and these are kept uh, in a vault, from what I understand. But he mentioned in this interview that there was a reading that edit he had been Pythagoras, and uh, and there was also a mention uh, in that interview that uh, Casey had been Edgar Casey had been a Sunday school teacher, and he said that's fascinating because one of the readings indicated that he wrote one of the books of the Bible. Well, Man. James uh, Sidney Kirkpatrick is a is a close friend, and he certainly spent um, lots of time here in the archives, looking at the readings and and working with um, Edgar Casey's diaries and journals and so forth. But few, there are a few readings that that uh, are not out in the public. I mean, there are stories about um, Roosevelt. I mean, Wilson's cousin coming and and meeting with. Um, uh, right. Harmon, but but any case, they, apparently there's a book written by William Church. Yes, and yes. Uh, and he, and he mentions that uh, Casey had been Pythagoras. That now that may be the case. It may be in his life reading that he was was given uh, a, a lifetime as Pythagoras, and he was also given a lifetime during the time, one of these epochs that um, that I was referring to, like ancient Egypt. Was one about the yeah. time of Jesus and and um, Edgar Casey as a character by the name of Lucius was involved in helping to develop the early church and in writing early uh, treatises, some of which became the early books of the Bible, and that that is huh. certainly the case. And and I'll check that, on the Pythagoras. Uh, That's uh, probably Irene. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely amazing and. Uh, and so you taught uh, psychology at the University of Maryland and uh, and then came back to the ARE. Was there a certain point in your life, Charles Thomas, when you 
became drawn back into the uh, into the uh, work of your grandfather and your father, and uh, and you certainly have had an amazing life. And before you answer the question, I just want to point out to our listeners that uh, when I was speaking with you a day or two ago on the phone, and I was asking you about books that you had written, and then I went on the internet, and uh, in fact I'm showing a slide on the uh, uh, on this now, but you have either written or edited or done forwards for over 18 books, according to what I saw on the Internet. And in addition, I saw on iTunes, and this is what I want to mention to our listeners, I found about 14 or 15 courses that you narrate uh, based on the Edgar Casey readings that are available on iTunes. And these are uh, realizing psychic potential, tuning your chakras, uh, everything from uh, getting a good night's sleep to uh, overcoming cancer, loss of a loved one, uh, learning to enjoy life and learning and uh, freedom from smoking, prosperity. These are just prolific topics. These are available on iTunes for our listeners uh, and are narrated by uh, Charles Thomas Casey. So, Some of those you just mentioned have to do with a... Um a concept that's so accessible to all of us that that comes up over and over in the readings. You were asking about the University of Maryland and and me coming to work at the ARE. Um, yes. And my training is as a child psychologist. And w- one of the ways that I got excited about coming to, to work at the ARE, besides my father just needing help, he said, I, the, the, this was in the late 60s and Jeff Stern's book had just become a, a New York Times bestseller called The Sleeping Prophet. And there were huge, uh, huge, there was huge public interest and the ARE was a small little, um, organization and, and my father just needed help and I agreed to come for a year and try to help and, um, I never left. <laughs> I came for a year and stayed for the rest of this lifetime, I think. But part of my interest was in the way my father sort of stimulated my interest was that that from time to time, parents typically of children who have a great deal of psychic ability contact the ARE wanting to know what to do, what's going on with their child. Is it really psychic ability? And if so, what should they do? And so I have had the the, uh, wonderful opportunity over the years, especially in those very early years of mine with the ARE, when my father was still alive, to do some research with some children, which the Casey, my grand, Edgar Casey's readings, that was very important for the ARE to do, to, that it would attract um, people who had psychic ability or, and of course, people who were interested in psychic ability. And so that, that was part of what really drew me to the ARE, an opportunity to, to research more carefully some of the information in the KC readings. But for early in my life, in, in college and, and even in graduate school, I was on the West Coast at the University of California as far as I could get from Virginia Beach, James, yeah. in the psychology department. And um, and yet, when I began to try, I decided to just, in spite of the accuracy of the readings that my grandfather had given for me, I wasn't at all sure that I wanted to to work in the organization and and, uh, sort of be in the shadow of of my grandfather and father and all of that. So I tried some of these tools that are just right at the heart of the Casey readings, working with my dreams and meditation and prayer and, and working with setting ideals, and those are all stories for another time. But it just, it uh jolted me how powerful and helpful and clear um, that those tools were for me and, and how helpful for me. And as I worked with the material, especially related to children from the Casey readings, there is this thing that comes up over and over about using the time just as children are going to sleep, adults too for that matter, but, but uh, children also as they're going to sleep to give them gentle suggestions, positive suggestions about uh, changes that would be helpful in their life, whether it's, um, you know, stopping wetting the bed or much more serious emotional 
uh, kinds of problems. And as we've worked with that tool of pre-sleep suggestion, it's become uh, clear from in the in the psychological community and clear from our research with that information that Casey reads that that can be very helpful. And so these things about getting a good night's sleep and stopping smoking and so forth, some of those are scripts that I put together to uh, for people to use as they're going to sleep to to make those particular changes in their in their lives. And and those have proven to be helpful. Well, I am certainly going to download some of those, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, as I mentioned, Charles Thomas, I awoke spiritually or into greater knowledge through Edgar Cayce in 1978, and over the next 33 years, I was a foreigner. I never lived in the United States, at least in, in relation to my job. We lived in Africa, we lived in Russia, I lived in India, South America for nine years, and and I just read. And uh, and Casey's, you know, a, a lot of people may not realize that the the diversity of the Casey reading. Uh, he really spoke a lot about science. Uh, and uh, and other fascinating topics that are timeless. That uh, um, Sidney Kirkpatrick mentioned in an interview that there is a reading in which he gives directions on how a per- perpetual motion machine could be developed for an engineer. And, That's true. Uh, yeah. And so his information is more, in my opinion, more pertinent now. Uh, than ever, it's always been pertinent, but it's so important now. And because Edgar Casey read the Bible once a year for his life in a commitment, uh, that is why I believe that uh, the the text of the readings, uh, you know, taps into the channel mind to a channel mind to an extent. And so some of the readings are sort of in uh, biblical vernacular, in biblical yeah. form of English. Uh, yeah. And and so there may be a tendency on some people to think that this is old information. And I am absolutely here to tell you otherwise. There, the Edgar Casey information is, is important now, perhaps more important now than ever before. And I highly encourage those of you listening to read Casey, to join the Association of Research and Enlightenment. To, if you have an opportunity, attend the conferences there. Uh, the people at the ARE are, and this is what I, I, I spent so much time, Charles Thomas, reading all of the religious information when I was overseas. I, I didn't watch television. I never lived in an English-speaking country, so I read. And, you know, in retrospect, it makes sense that I chose that for myself, but I read everything. I read, uh, I worked in Muslim countries, I worked in Buddhist countries and Hindu countries, and I read all of the religious texts. And then I got into uh, Jane Roberts, Seth, Lobsang Rampa, uh, all of the other things. And it is the Edgar Casey information that brings me back into the energy of the Christos, the energy of of humility, the energy that feels home. I have a tendency as a scientist to to really get into the scientific aspects, but it is the Casey readings, the Casey energy, and the people of the IRE that carry that feeling of home, of soul family, and and that's so, so important. We can get into the scientific aspects of metaphysics and uh you know the ideas of nonlinear time and and all of that and and it's important knowledge, but it is the Casey information that brings me back into soul purpose and uh, and I think that is so very important well, it's spoken beautifully james thank you i i I hope that that's the the, the purpose of a r e really to to um touch people such as yourself, and I hope we can keep keep doing that. Well, you know, Charles Thomas, I tell people the ARE is the most important spiritual organization. You go to some of these conferences, and there's like, uh, there's almost an aloof 
the situation where there's a speaker on the stage, a channel on the stage, and it's like you're in class attending, and while the information is valuable, you don't get that necessarily, you don't get the interaction, you don't get that right. family feel, and you don't get the, you know, the, the opportunity to approach. And everyone I have met in the ARE is extremely approachable, down to earth, and carry this humility. And I think that that's one of the things that the Edgar Casey work teaches so well, uh, is the importance of humility, that once we get into self-aggrandizement, then we're no longer carrying the vibration, uh, you know, of the pattern, of the line. And so we have another question here, Charles Thomas, and we'll end in about 15 minutes, if that's okay with you. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, the question is, in these times when things seem to be going so fast, how do we maintain sole purpose? And, and what is sole purpose, briefly, based on the Edgar Casey reading? Well, you know, the... the I would certainly agree that things um, seem to be moving very fast in, in lots of, of different ways, whether we're just, just in so many ways. And the, the, there is a, there is a uh, for me at least, James, a, a core of, of uh, tools, just basic tools that are in the Casey readings that are mentioned over and over again. As people ask, I mean, certainly the most frequently asked question in the Casey readings was one of the most certainly was was uh, how can I grow spiritually? What what do I uh, need to do to improve my life from a from a spiritual perspective? And there were these tools that that um, were mentioned over and over again, and and m many people are frustrated, I think that. That this is not a secret formula that, um, you know, some magic words that you can recite, um, at midnight every night for 28 days and you're suddenly transformed spiritually. These are tools that, um, uh, some of them are, are, are defined in a little different way by the Casey readings, but they're tools that we have, um, heard about in Sunday school in a sense, or certainly we've, we've read about in our, in our reading of spiritual literature, and there are things like working with meditation and the setting of uh, ideals. And the readings, the Casey readings, define ideals in a fairly specific way, not goals, but a higher, a higher focus than goals. And working with the um, what the, the Bible talked about, and the Casey readings talked about, is the fruits of the spirit: gentleness and kind, choosing. Just uh, taking ourselves by the scruff of the neck, moment by moment. I mean, dozens of times a day, and choosing those fruits of the spirit as we respond to each other. And a key, a key, James, in the, in the readings. I've been doing a, a seminar recently on on 18 readings given for individuals, 18 different people, life readings, who were told that this might well be their last incarnation in the earth, it, using my language, sort of if they played their cards right, they might well be finished with the earth plane this this go-around. And I, as a psychologist, I slipped on my psychologist hat and, and looked at those readings, and, and I had access to the names of the people who had those readings and was uh, and knew some of those people, no family members, but, but knew some of them pretty well and, and looked at the correspondence and so forth. And there are uh, it, it, uh, half a dozen key tools. One of those is is not holding grudges, and and that's the word from the readings. And it's in all eighteen of these people's readings that not not uh, holding resentment and j jealousy, anger, hurt re involving relationships, and committing to the proposition that there is a continuity to life and that. Um, we there is a non physical aspect to us that that um can can grow, can evolve, that the readings talk about as a soul, and that we commit time and energy and, and focus of our lives to that proposition. 
so anyway, there there are these these tools, and they don't sound in in a way, especially as you mentioned, James, in the language of the reading, sometimes sort of biblically oriented. They don't sound very flashy or um, or uh, super secret, and yet they are just in my experience, just key and and central to the Casey Readings perspective on how we move spiritually in this in this lifetime. And again, you know, as a child psychologist, James, you know, I, I was fascinated by dozens and dozens, hundreds really, of parents who asked Edgar Casey in in readings how how could they, as parents, Get, get in closer touch with God, and especially how could they explain God and help their children uh, come to a close relationship with God. And over and over, almost without exception, few exceptions, but almost without exception, the answer was in nature. In nature. Now, you're a geologist, James. I, you know the beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty. There is a... a uh, life force that we can experience in nature that we can also easily get away from in this fast-moving society in which many of us live. And and I would, again, it, it almost sounds like going backwards, but I would just um, refer again to this repeated uh, suggestion in the readings to, to stay in touch with and get in deeper connection with uh, nature as, as a way to, to center ourselves as we move through these crazy times we're in. Well, you know, Charles Thomas, when you and I were speaking earlier this week, uh, you were talking about, uh, we were talking about Virginia Beach, how, how Edgar Casey had been told to go there and uh, that it was a special energy and that the uh, sand uh, along the beaches uh, had an unusually uh, benevolent uh, composition of, uh, of beneficial uh, trace minerals, including gold. And yeah. uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I read that, uh, and, you know, Edgar had actually mentioned that it's beneficial to bury yourself in the sand. Yeah. And so uh, are you still there? I am. Hello? I am. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm here. My phone has cut off twice, so I'm just checking. But I read sure. that when Ann and I were living in Brazil, and I was in my 20s, and we had just moved to a new section of Brazil. And, in you know, the entire population of Brazil, if you look at the map, is on the coast with just one or two exceptions. Uh, and so we went to a beach, and uh, in Brazil at that particular time, you had certain beaches that were guarded and safe in certain beaches that weren't, and we didn't know that. And so we went to the beach, and uh, it was a gorgeous beach, beautiful day. And so I said to Ann, I'm going to bury myself in the sand because the, the Casey book <laughs> talked the benefits of that. And so I buried myself in the ha, ha, bur- dug a little hole. She buried me in the sand, and there were a couple of uh, guys watching that. And so... As soon as I got buried, they walked up and grabbed Dan's purse and took off running. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, well that is certainly, that's a part of the I Casey Ratings. Well, I was young and fit, and so I, bro- I burst out of it. And then I uh, went and chased these guys and caught them. And then they pulled a knife <laughs> on me and took my watch. And so, <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Well, but, you're going to need to come back here and bury your beat your yourself in this sand right here in, in front oh, of the you ARE thing. Where you do it? That was a, that was just a funny story. But uh, I absolutely, uh, the next time we come to Virginia Beach, want to uh, want to do that. But I do believe. You know, part of what I studied was that there are certain places on the earth that I think uh, have always been recognized as sacred and uh, that maybe the veil is thin. And I think Virginia Beach is one of these. And uh, I attribute it to uh, uh, a lot of different reasons. There are different types of what I call sacred sites, and I think mineralogy has a lot to do with it. And so uh, I know that Virginia Beach is a uh, is a place that Casey 
also said would be safe in the event of earth changes and that uh, uh, had a very, very special light. And so uh, it's uh, just an amazing place. And there's been a lot of new changes at the ARE. That that facility is just beautiful. There's a library. That meditation room is just amazing. And so uh, I really want to encourage everyone. Uh, and I'm speaking uh, with um, Allison Ray, uh, Charles Thomas, and to our listeners. And we are going to set up, they have agreed to set up a very special discounted rate for membership uh, to the ARE for people attending our event in Colorado. And we have a very, very special event, uh, May 29th through June 1st in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's called the Earthkeeper Stargate. And we have some incredible speakers. Our keynote speakers are uh, Dr. Charles Thomas Casey, John Van Auken, who is just an amazing man. And we have uh, Dr. Robert Schock. We have David Hatcher Childress, Graham Hancock, John Major Jenkins, Rick, Dr. Rick Strassman, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph McNamara and Dr. John Ryan. And we have uh, Joanne Parks and Max and uh, Michelle Nosarino and Sean Aran. And Charles, I was speaking with John Van Auken a while back, and uh, John had written an article about crystal skulls. And I often, you know, Edgar Casey speaks about uh, halls of records, how the Atlanteans, uh, you know, recorded data for future generations. It is, uh, you know, the memory basis of computers is silicon, and quartz is silicon dioxide. And I wonder if some of these legends around crystal skulls are that data can be stored in these, and uh, perhaps uh, these are... These are computers that can play back information because it seems to me that if the Atlanteans were so highly advanced, they wouldn't necessarily put all their records on uh, wall carvings, that they might have had some sophisticated computer systems that we aren't uh, aware of yet. That's but, a uh, fascinating idea, James. Uh, in interesting. I and, you know, John was talking about how Edgar said that the ancients considered the shape of the cranium uh, to be sacred. And so, if yeah. quartz, you know, quartz is, is uh, piezoelectric, meaning it can actually emit an electrical charge. Quartz is used to receive and transmit radio waves. And sure. it's also uh, chromioluminous. It can actually emit lights. You know, wow. I, I grew up in Arkansas which is the largest singular deposit of quartz on the planet. A lot of people don't realize that. And there is also a um, fault line that runs through Arkansas called the New Madrid line. And we did a conference called the Law of One Conference in Arkansas uh, in 2012. And uh, just before that, there had been some earthquakes in the area. And... I don't know, you may remember this, but there was an incident where 15,000 birds fell out of the sky in Arkansas on January 1st in 2012. My goodness. My goodness. It was on national news. No one knew what had happened. And, uh, you know, I grew up there. My father was an avid outdoorsman, and I had seen that happen several times. And so my theory of what happened is that it's a scientific fact that when you apply mechanical pressure to quartz, it releases an electrical charge. Now, the particular type of bird that fell out of the sky are very sensitive to uh, vibrations. In fact, that's how they uh, migrate. Wow. And so I think a piezoelectric charge was released from this 170-mile-long deposit of natural quartz in Arkansas, and that it temporarily uh, stunned these highly sensitive birds and they fell out of the sky and died from blunt trauma on hitting the ground. But I think that was actually the crystals that did that. <laughs> My and, goodness. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of attributes that, uh, you know, Edgar Casey talked about a lot of the technology of Atlantis is coming around. And I, so I've often wondered if perhaps some of these ancient crystal skulls were, in truth, libraries that store data. And in some time in the future, perhaps we'll be able to... Uh, to actually retrieve data from those. Uh, Wouldn't that be uh, that interesting be, idea, James? We, we need to check it. Yeah. 
Well, Charles Thomas, I've taken an hour of your time, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am. I hold you, and you're just a gentle and wonderful person, and I look forward to seeing you in Colorado. And uh, we will be uh, putting out an advertisement on our newsletters on how people can uh, join the ARE. And uh, it is absolutely, in my opinion, in all honesty, the most important spiritual organization on the planet at this time. It carries the energy of the Christos. It carries the, the humility that is so important on our path of enlightenment. And so, Charles, I honor you deeply, you and your wonderful wife, Leslie, and for all of the people at the ARE. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, James, so much. I look forward to seeing you in Colorado in May. Take care Absolutely. of yourself. Absolutely. And if things work out uh, as we feel they will, perhaps uh, Anne and I will be residents of Virginia Beach at some point in the future. Oh, we look forward to that, James. Goodbye. Thank you very much. And thank, thank all you. of you for listening. In closing, I would simply like to mention again that uh, we have an incredible group of speakers coming to Colorado. These are all members of the Law of One, and I think that there will be an incredible, beautiful energy uh, in this reunion. Uh, Dr. Casey, Dr. Robert Schock, who is an amazing, gentle, brilliant scientist, John Van Auken, who we believe to be the reincarnation of the Apostle John, Dr. Rick Strassman, Graham Hancock, a brilliant speaker, David Hatcher Childress, the voice of ancient aliens and a really wonderful, warm person. Michelle Nosarino, jo uh, Joanne Parks and Max, John Major Jenkins, uh, so, so many more. And thank you all for attending. And again, thank you, Dr. Casey.